all happened in the East Tower. One of the great tragedies in Chicago's history, the, the largest loss of life. What it looks like they're doing is screaming. Room 441. Bodies had a tendency to pop up out of the ground. I'm Mark Seaton. I work as a tour guide for Chicago Hauntings. Uh, my name is Bill Savage. I teach Chicago literature, history, and culture um, in the English department at Northwestern University and at the Newbury Library of Chicago. The idea of being haunted by a ghost. Usually something horrible has happened there from what I've at least encountered. My perspective on these haunted places is of a scientific rationalist. Chicago's haunted by lots of things that are kind of invisible or hidden or not thought about, but they're more larger historical events and socioeconomic realities. There's been reports, um, definitely between the 60s and 70s, of horrible deaths that have happened there. There's a few construction workers who died while they were building it. Uh, a few of them plunged to their deaths. There's also been a few suicides that have happened inside Marina City. A couple of murders that have happened there as well. There was a young woman who was stabbed to death, a man who shot his mother and then he killed himself. But one of the things that gets to be bizarre about it is that out of all of these reports, they've all happened in the East Tower. The question is what's going on in the East Tower that causes all of these, all this strange phenomenon to be happening or these accidental deaths. They've seen shadow figures inside the towers. There's also reports of having cold spots inside the tower, um, people feeling bouts of depression. Marina City is concrete, literally, concrete evidence of the racism and white flight that shaped so much social policy in this city in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Think about the name of the place, Marina City. It was designed to be a self-contained city within the city so that white middle class people would have somewhere safe to live. The fact that you could live in that building, park your car in that building, do all your shopping in that building, and never have to leave it. You're not in one of those changing neighborhoods on the south or west sides where white flight was happening due to white racism. Obviously, one of the great tragedies in Chicago's history, the, the largest loss of life at a single incident in the history of the city. The Eastland was a boat, it was about the size of a mini cruise ship. It was docked in front of the Reed Murdoch building on July 24th, 1915. After the boat capsized, there was 2,500 people that went into the water and 844 people lost their lives, including 17 entire families. Nobody famous was on that boat. Nobody famous died, unlike the Titanic. It was working class people, immigrants, from the Western Electric Company on Cicero and Berwyn. They brought the bodies to the 2nd Regiment Armory, and that building later on would become famous because it was turned into Harpo Studios um, in the 1980s. For the site, people have reported of hearing screams and cries of terror coming from uh, the river, um, right where the Eastland was docked, faces um, being seen in the water. There's also reports of people seeing um, people drowning in the river. Harpo Studios were where Harpo Studios was. Uh, they tore it down last year. There's reports of seeing ghosts and apparitions um, inside Harpo Studios. Uh, the most popular one was the Grey Lady, um, who they believe was one of the victims at the Eastland tragedy. What I think should really haunt Chicagoans about that disaster was how long it was ignored and covered up. For almost a century, most of official Chicago ignored that event. It didn't reshape any policy. Um, unlike the Iroquois Theater Fire, which helped create safety standards in public buildings where you have panic bars, other tragedies in the city have like reshaped, literally reshaped the world um, and how we relate to one another in space. The hauntings that take place there is mostly associated to the Glasner House. It's haunted by the architect Henry Hobson Richardson. When he first designed the building, he never got to see the actual house completed, but there have been reports that people have seen his ghost inside the house. Also over at Prairie Avenue is where the Fort Dearborn Massacre uh, took place uh, back in 1812. In the 1980s, there was a construction crew that came through and they started doing um, some digging. They were doing some, uh, some road work and they ended up unearthing the bodies to the Fort Dearborn Massacre. And ever since then, there's been reports of uh, spirits and apparitions popping up in the area. More specifically, people have stated of seeing these ghosts um, running and what it looks like they're doing is screaming. Prairie Avenue was a uh, prime example of first uh, neighborhood being built up by the rich and being an opulent place. The big industrials in the city had their mansions down there. When the north side became more fashionable, when the Palmers moved north, that area in the near south side was abandoned. And it became part of a vice district, part of a basically a ghetto and a slum. And that deterioration, that uh, class movement across the city is something that I think should be paid more attention to. 
Congress Plaza Hotel is one of the most haunted places in Chicago, um, if not the most haunted place. There's room 441. There have been reports of objects moving around the room on their own. Um, also, people waking up in the middle of the night to the silhouette of a dark figure of a woman standing at the foot of their bed. And there's also reports of having the covers ripped off of them in the middle of the night. You can stay in the room, in room 441, yeah, if you'd like. But what should haunt Chicagoans about the Congress Plaza Hotel is that it was the site of the single longest strike in American history. Ten years, the custodial uh, staff were on strike to get a living wage, and they failed. Um, after ten years, they were broken. Chicagoans should be haunted by the class inequity that the labor movement tried to address back in the 19th century and tries to address today with the fight for 15. If you go to Lincoln Park Zoo, more specifically, it's the barn that is haunted there in Lincoln Park Zoo. The reason why it is haunted is because it's built on Chicago City Cemetery, Chicago's first cemetery. All the bodies, ex with a few exceptions, were relocated um, to other cemeteries because it was low, swampy ground. It wasn't very good. I mean, high water bodies had a tendency to pop up out of the ground. So you can see how it could become a, an urban legend of haunting. Dr. Lester Fisher, uh, he was the director there at Lincoln Park Zoo. And when he was first building the barn, they unearthed, uh, I think it was 10 bodies from the Chicago City Cemetery that were still buried there. And he contacted the city of Chicago for uh, a, a few times, you know, I think it was for a couple of weeks, but nobody ever um, responded back to him. So he just took the executive decision and decided to put the bodies back. And those were the, where, where the hauntings take place. People have reported of hearing um, voices inside the barn. Um, there's also been reports of seeing people walking around wearing clothing from the early 1800s. Cogently, perhaps, Lincoln Park, very close to the, the cemetery area, was the site of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. 2122 Clark Street. The garage is gone now. There's just a parking lot and a lawn that's there. People have heard the dog Highball barking, um, who was in the garage at the time during the massacre. They've also reported of hearing machine gun fire coming from the site. You know, if the St. Valentine's Day Massacre haunts Chicago, it should be about the legacy of organized crime in this town, which includes not just the corruption of politicians and judges and the police department, um, but it also includes the kind of uh, racial violence that we see today, or racialized violence, where there are neighborhoods that are marginal, where crime thrives. Today, as we confront a city where certain neighborhoods are marginalized and more violent than other neighborhoods, where that violence is in part fueled by the drug trade, that's the same thing that fueled the, the killings of Prohibition. To this very day, the city is haunted by gang violence in a very literal way. We don't need guys with fedoras and Thompson submachine guns disappearing through walls to be haunted by gang violence. Gang violence is part of the reality of the city.